بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين Last episode we were discussing about uh, the eligibility of uh, tamayim and talismans uh, amulets and talismans in Islam basically we went through a question which was uh, uh, the, the questioner was asking whether it is allowed to use amulets and talismans uh, for whatever purposes for the purpose of barakah for the purpose of curing ailments or for whatever X number of reasons that people use them um, we read some hadith uh, from the answer which is a compilation of, of the answers from uh, Fatawa Lejna Daima, uh, the standing committee, you know, uh, answers from uh, Sheikh Al Albani and other uh, Kabair ulema. And <clears throat> today we are going to, in this part two of the episode number three, we are going to discuss the other um, evidences that the Sheikh has mentioned over here with regards to. Uh, using uh, talismans or amulets so here it is mentioned that amulets tamima or tamaim are things made from pearls or bones that are worn on the necks of children or adults or are hung up in houses or cars in order to ward off evil especially the evil eye or to bring some benefits uh, these are the comments of the scholars on the various kinds of amulets and the rulings on each kind. These comments contain important and useful points. So the compilation, the answer, uh, it compiles certain comments from different shiuch of the past, the great ulema that have passed by, uh, which mentions about amulets and uh, uh, talismans. Number one, Sheikh Suleiman ibn Abdul Wahhab said, Know that the scholars among the Sahaba and Tabi'in and those who came after them differed as to whether it is permissible to hang amulets which only contain words from the Quran or names and attributes of Allah. So the difference of opinion amongst the scholars of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in was not whether the amulets are, can be used from any other sources, but the difference of opinion was whether from the Quran and the words and the attributes and names of Allah can be used in amulets or not. One group said that this is permissible. This was the view of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As and others. This is the apparent meaning of the report narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha and it was the view of Abu Ja'far al-Baqir and Ahmed according to one report they interpreted the hadith as refer referring to amulets which involve shirk with regard to those which contain words from the Quran or the names and the attributes of Allah then they are like Rukia which uses the same words I say this appears to be the view of Ibn al-Qayyim. Another group said that it, this is not permissible. This was the view of Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud and Abdullah Ibn Abbas, two of very prominent and close companions of Prophet Muhammad and is the apparent meaning of the view of Hudayfa, Uqba, Ibn Amir and Ibn Akim. May Allah be pleased with them. This was also the view of a group of the Tabi'in, which are the students of the Sahaba. The students, Tabi'in, are the students of the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu including the companions of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Ahmed. According to one report, which was chosen by most of his companions, it was also the view of the latest scholars who quoted this and similar hadith as evidence. The apparent meaning is that it is general in application and does not differentiate between amulets which contain Quran and amulets which contain other things other than Quran, unlike Ruqya where there is a differentiation. This is supported by the fact that the Sahaba who narrated 
the hadith understood it to be general in meaning and as was quoted above from Ibn Mas'ud. Abu Da'ud narrated that Isa ibn Hamza said, I entered upon Abdullah ibn Akim, and his face was red due to high fever. I said, why don't you hang up an amulet? He said, we seek refuge with Allah from that. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, whoever hangs up anything will be entrusted to its care. This scholarly difference was concerning hanging up amulets which contain Quran or names and attributes of Allah. So what do you think about the things which were in innovated later on? Doing spells, using the names of shayateen, the devils, uh, using the names of shayateen and others, and hanging them up, and even being attached to those shayateen, seeking refuge in them, slaughtering animals for them, asking them to ward off harm and bring benefits, action which are pure shirk. So what do you think about that? This is prevalent among many of the people except for those whom Allah keeps safe and sound. Think about that, what the Prophet ﷺ said and what was the practice of the Sahaba and Tabi'een and what the scholars after them mention on this topic and others. Then look at what happened in the later generations. It will become clear to you what the religion of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is and how it has now become alienated in all ways. And Allah is the one whose help we seek. This is from Taisir al-Aziz al-Hamid. Number two, Shaykh Hafiz Hukami said, if they, that is amulets, contain clear written Quranic verses or Sahih Hadith, there was some dispute among the Salaf, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and those who followed them as to whether they are permissible or not. Some of them, that is some of the Salaf, said that this was permissible. This was narrated from Aisha, radiallahu anha, Abu Ja'far Muhammad ibn Ali, and others among the Salaf. Some of them said that this was not allowed. They regarded it as makruh and not permitted. They included Abdullah ibn Akim, Abdullah ibn Amr, Uqba ibn Amir, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and his companions such as Al-Aswad and Al-Qama, and those who came after them, such as Ibrahim al-Nakha'i and others, may Allah have mercy on them. Undoubtedly, not allowing that is a safer precaution to prevent means that lead to wrong beliefs, especially in our own times. If most of the Sahaba and Tabi'een regarded it as makruh in those noble times, when the faith in their hearts was greater than a mountain, then regarding it as makruh in these times of trials and tribulations is more appropriate and is more on the safe side. So how about when this concession has led people to things which are purely haram and they have made it a means to those things? For example, they make amulets for seeking refuge on which they write an ayah or surah or the phrase Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, which means in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Then underneath it, they put some devilish mumbo jumbo, the meaning of which no one knows except one who has read their books. Or they divert the hearts of the common folk from putting their trust only in Allah and make them dependent on the things that they have written. And most of them frighten the people before anything even happens to them. One of them will come to the person whom he wants to trick out of his money, knowing that the person is relying on him and trusts him, and he says, such and such thing is going to happen to you or your family or your wealth or to you. Or he says, you have a 
qareem, a constant companion, a, a jinn from among the jinn, or the like. And he describes things to him and tells him things about himself that the, shayat, the, that the shaitan whispers to him to make him think that he has true insight that he has true insight and that he cares about him and wants to br bring him some benefit when the heart of the ignorant fool is filled with fear of what has been described to him he turns away from his lord and turns to this charlatan with all his heart and soul he puts his trust in him and relies on him instead of Allah and says to him, What is the way out from the things that you have described? What is the means of warding them off? It is as if the charlatan has control over benefit and harm, at which point his hopes are raised and he, and he becomes more greedy, wondering how much he will be able to take. So he tells him, if you give me such and such, I will write an amulet for that which will be this long and this wide. And he describes it and speaks to him in a nice and gentle manner. <clears throat> then he hangs up his amulet, this amulet, to protect him from such and such diseases. Do you think after all that we have mentioned that this belief is from a minor shirk? shirk? No way. It means that one is taking one's God, someone else other than Allah, putting one's trust in someone other than Allah, turning to someone other than Him, relying on the deeds of created beings and trying to divert people from their religion. Can the shaitan do any of these tricks except with the help of his devilish brethren among mankind. Say, who can guard and protect you in the night or in the day from the punishment most of the most gracious, that is Allah? Nay, but they turn away from the remembrance of their Lord. And this is uh, an ayah, the translation of an ayah in Surah Al-Anbiya. Then along with the devilish mumbo-jumbo, he writes on the amulet, something from the Quran and hangs it up when he is not Tahir in a state of purity, when he is in a state of minor or major impurity. And he never shows any respect towards it or keeps it away from other things. By Allah, none of the enemies of Allah have treated his book with as much contempt as these heretics who claim to be Muslims.